Everything was packed. Three weeks supply of food, gear, and all the powdered apple cider we could drink. We had arrived in Talkeetna, Alaska by car, but no road could take us further towards our objective. Now we were boarding a plane that would take us into the heart of the Alaskan wilderness. Denali, the high one, translated in the native Athabascan language, it is a mountain you can see for hundreds of miles, and one with a reputation for ferocious conditions. Towering more than 10,000 feet above the surrounding Alaskan range, it has encapsulated climbers since the early 1900s, although a full decade of failed attempts and scandals passed before a verified summit was obtained in 1913. From the base of the summit, it is the tallest mountain on land, and due to the combination of its proximity to the Arctic Circle, high altitude, and exposure to storms off the northern Pacific, Denali is considered to be one of the coldest mountains on Earth. Official temperature recordings have clocked below negative 100 Fahrenheit, and wind speeds can reach over 100 miles per hour. Negative 40 degree sleeping bags, 8,000 meter boots, mitts, parkas, bomb-proof expedition tents, take the most extreme version of any piece of weather protective gear, and we had it on that plane. We were ready for the worst. We arrived and unloaded at base camp, a glacial airstrip located between towering vertical granite walls. Fuel isn't allowed on planes with passengers, so we pick it up from a supply on the airstrip and organize our payloads. 20 gallons of fuel, 24 bags of food, layers, tents, ropes, axes, crampons, snowshoes, it adds up fast. Denali isn't the kind of mountain you just go and do in a whim. It takes a lot of planning, and each of us had spent the last six months getting into the best shape of our lives. On this mountain, you're really on your own. No Sherpas or porters, you carry your own gear as far as you need it to go. So when you're packed and ready, you've got 120 pounds to haul up that mountain. But we were in no rush. Three weeks is usually enough time to get lucky with the weather, and in our leisure, we stayed at base camp the next day to get organized and get accustomed to life on a glacier. I found that the west buttress fits into roughly three distinct segments. The lower mountain, the mid-mountain, and upper mountain. The lower mountain begins with a descent of Heartbreak Hill onto the main part of the Cahiltna Glacier, an enormous 44-mile-long glacier that runs down the channel between Denali and Foraker. Frequently, this is done at night, due to the relative high temperatures of the lower glacier destabilizing the snow bridges and creating poor overall snow travel conditions. But since it was still mid-May, we found perfect conditions for travel. On the main glacier, 5.5 miles of mostly flat terrain took us to Camp 1 at 7,800 feet at the base of Ski Hill. All right, so it's uh, day three. And today we moved from base camp to around the Camp 1 area or so. We're staying a little bit outside of Camp 1 just to keep to ourselves and not get all caught up in the traffic while we still have the option of camping elsewhere. On the lower mountain, leisure and rest were our bread and butter. Energy and physiologic resources are limited, especially as we ascend, so traveling only a few hours per day kept us out of the sun and feeling our best. We're only moving for what, like four hours? Something like that? Yes, yeah, it was like three and some change, yeah. With this in mind, the next day we moved only to 9,500 feet of elevation, just beyond Ski Hill. This is halfway to the next established camp, but the half move prevents us from carrying gear back and forth while allowing the leisure to day. The next day we moved up to 11 camp at 11,000 feet, concluding the lower mountain portion of the ascent. This is typically a well-sheltered place, situated in an amphitheater-like feature that blocks out most of the wind that travels up the Cahiltna. Despite this, it can snow heavily here and accumulate more than just about anywhere else on this route. We all felt pretty good, good enough to eat and drink well, but we also knew that our physiological climatization response was beginning to take effect here. So it was a good place to hang out and acclimatize for our first official rest day.
Now it's time to begin the mid-mountain phase of the ascent. At this point, we will be placing caches of gear along the route to reduce our sled weight and help acclimatize via the climb high, sleep low principle. Our next objective calls for a cache at 13,500 feet, just past Windy Corner. Windy Corner is the choke point of this phase. Winds have the tendency to funnel through this corridor, which can make for hazardous frostbite conditions. The corner itself, when icy, can also present a falling hazard towards the ice cliffs below. Sleds complicate this further, but for the cache we chose to carry only backpacks. To gauge the conditions on Windy Corner from camp, we're looking at Squirrel Point, which will tell us what the winds will be like. Following our rest day, conditions look okay around Windy Corner. Winds around 15 miles per hour with mid-level temperatures aren't so bad. So we cache that day and return to camp. <laughs> just gonna forget about that part. Now we are ready to move to 14 camp. We just need a weather opportunity. But as we kept our eyes fixed on Squirrel Point, conditions only got worse. High winds and low temperatures kept us at 11 camp the next day. Things didn't get a whole lot better the following day, but temperatures rose enough to make the move possible. Winds were still gusting in the 40s through the corridor, making full skin coverings a necessity. As we topped out on Motorcycle Hill and began ascending Squirrel Hill, winds hit hard, flipping our sleds and even keeping them airborne at times. But after five hours in the blender, we arrived exhausted at 14 camp. Being the only team at 11 to move up, we were now on a different schedule than the other teams that had landed with us. This would prove consequential later. Today was kind of a big day. We moved up from 11 camp to 14, where we are now. Hauling a good amount of gear, some sleds. Kind of tricky around Wooden Corner with those sleds. Tricky. That's one thing. It's always, yeah. You kind of like want to Crazy winds. Oh yeah, the wind, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was something else. Especially around Squirrel Point, it was like, this it was crazy. But uh, yeah, we're here now. Good spirits. We're gonna have a good night's sleep, and then I think tomorrow we're just gonna go down and grab our cash, which, luckily for us, is full of food. Just what yeah. we need right now. And candy. <laughs> so much candy. Now at 14,200 feet, we were noticing a breathing pattern called Chain Stokes Respirations. This occurs during sleep and is characterized by a short period of hyperventilation or breathing too quickly followed by an extended period of apnea or lack of breathing. In the setting of high altitude, the disruption of normal breathing leading to chain stokes is actually caused by the first and most important step to acclimatization, breathing faster and deeper. Increasing ventilation allows more oxygen to diffuse into blood and compensate for the lower partial pressure. But increased ventilation also allows more CO2 to diffuse out of the blood. This creates a condition known as respiratory alkalosis. Alkaline because CO2 is converted into carbonic acid in blood, so lower CO2 means lower acid. The problem arises because in a healthy individual, elevated CO2 levels in blood are the primary trigger for spontaneous breathing. When CO2 levels are lower, that trigger isn't really reached, and apnea ensues until oxygen in the blood becomes so low that it triggers the secondary unstable breathing response to hypoxia. This instability is thought to result in the Chain-Stokes breathing pattern. While not a very serious condition at altitude, periodic breathing degrades sleep quality and restfulness. Acetazolamide, or Diamox, is a drug commonly used to combat periodic breathing patterns at altitude. Acetazolamide is a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, meaning it prevents the conversion of CO2 to carbonic acid and vice versa. When carbonic acid dissolves in the blood, it breaks into a proton and a bicarbonate ion. In the kidneys, when the body removes waste, it throws out the bicarbonate ion with the other waste products, but it needs carbonic anhydrase to turn that bicarbonate ion back into CO2 in order to reabsorb it. When acetazolamide inhibits carbonic anhydrase, the bicarbonate is left as it is, unable to be reabsorbed and is lost in urine. Bicarbonate is a base, and a loss of a base from the blood makes the blood more acidic. This is called metabolic acidosis, and it helps combat the respiratory alkalosis brought about by the high-altitude-induced hyperventilation. 
The lower blood pH helps stimulate peripheral chemoreceptors in the carotid artery involved in spontaneous breathing and ultimately works towards reducing occurrences of Shane Stokes breathing. At 14 camp, our team waded through a snow system, grabbing our cash at 13.5, resting, and of course, playing cards. Going on food there, Roberts. <laughs> I don't want to talk about it. I'm concerned. <laughs> we used to have um, Tabasco. Frozen salt. Now it was time to cash on the ridge at 16, requiring us to ascend the fixed lines. The fixed lines of the West Buttress are placed on the steepest section by the National Park Service, about 55 degrees at worst. They run about 800 vertical feet, starting just over 1,000 vertical feet above camp, and can be a bit of a bottleneck on busy days. With the other teams on our schedule still stuck at 11 camp, we did not have that problem, and our cash day was a smooth five hours. 14 camp, however, is where wind can really become a problem, and when high pressure finally came in the next day, it brought high winds and cold air with it. The winds blew all of the fresh snow off the ridge and fixed lines, this meant blue ice was going to be the theme of the upper mountain. Lucky for us, the wind died down the next morning and gave way to a beautiful, warm, sunny day. This would be our day to move up the fixed lines to high camp. Now we were ascending the upper mountain segment of the climb where the views become progressively more stunning and our sleds were far behind us, buried at 14 camp. You kind of have to carry a lot of weight in your pack on this move, so it's a challenging day. Above the fixed lines, one more short fixed line segment exists on the section called Washburn's Thumb. Above that, within a couple hours, we reached high camp at 17,200 feet. It's amazing how different the feel is at 17 camp than at 14. It's very easy to get out of breath there, and the wind is just relentless. Also, the sun almost never fully sets from this high up. We quickly got set up and took a long look at the next segment of the climb, the Autobahn. Here we have one of the most dangerous parts of the West Buttress, which frequently has fatalities of climbers who lose their footing and are unable to self-arrest. We even witnessed an unarrested fall 1,000 feet down the Autobahn just after we arrived. It is a part of the mountain that sees high winds frequently, resulting in icy traverse conditions. The slope can reach 45 to 50 degrees in places, and self-arresting is often unrealistic. The safest way is to travel in good conditions, take the proper time to focus on footwork, and use picket protection. The next morning, a teammate developed HAPE, or High Altitude Pulmonary Edema. After developing HAPE, our teammate was evacuated from high camp off the mountain. Both incidents wore on morale, but we kept positive and focused on building wind walls to protect our camp. Now the day after arriving, conditions were no longer ideal. Wind had picked up significantly and a storm was rolling in. Teams already at 17 camp used the nice weather day to make their summit bids and return to 14 camp. Teams stuck at 11 used it to move up to 14. They're now alone at 17 camp when the storm was coming. As the wind intensified, we strengthened our walls, fully encircling our complex with ice three feet thick. The work was exhausting, especially on rationed, dehydrated food, but it saved us when the storm really hit. Winds clocked in at over 60 miles per hour, temperatures with wind chill were 60 below, and doing anything outside of the tent became a near impossibility. Thankfully, the wind walls mostly held up, with only one section collapsing and destroying one of our tents. Oh, all right, well. Seventeen. Yeah, day six. We're almost been here. Uh, we're, uh, tonight will be night six. Yeah, that's right. Nights. Yeah. Now we're pinned in this windstorm here. The gusts are. Tomorrow we're gonna break sand, right? Yeah. Yeah, gusts are hitting us six to nine per hour. Roberts was just out there and he got blown over. So we're trying to hold the tent up with our feet right now. <laughs> spent the last three days building are getting completely so they're collapsing left and right. Uh, yeah, it's kind of a wild time in here. We may end up waking up at some point tonight with the tent just on our faces. Uh, 
When the winds finally died down, we were all ready to get to the top and get out of camp. The first segment of the summit day is the Autobahn, and careful climbing practices got us across without issue despite the blue ice conditions. After the Autobahn, we reached Denali Pass, where we turned southeast and made our way up the slope past the football field and up Pig Hill, the last steep segment before the summit ridgeline. are incredible. This is the top of North America, more than three vertical miles above the surrounding tundra. Getting here has been a humbling 18-day journey of good times, hard days, and good old perseverance. Oh man, this is incredible. Pretty oh, good, yeah. pretty stoked. Yeah, this is like, yeah. It's a strange combination of like always knowing that we would summit and like truly thinking that we were never going to summit. <laughs> Yeah, it was a rough last few days in the tent, not knowing that, but uh, we're still having a blast. Yeah, it's great that we got up here. This truck is gnarly. Only four days later, we were back at the airstrip following a smooth descent. Although worth noting, on the way down the Autobahn, we experienced a magnitude 6.1 earthquake, which was kind of wild. We felt the ice crack underneath us, and you could hear the cracks running down the glacier and echoing off the mountains as they formed past 17 camp and down through 14 camp. Aside from that, the descent was uneventful. We followed the ascent route exactly. Climbing Denali is something I would recommend to those with many years of mountaineering experience and contending with cold weather conditions. The climb was fantastic and an unforgettable experience, but Denali is not the kind of mountain I'd want to be on without somebody who knows it specifically. Because conditions can be so dynamic and difficult to interpret, having a guide who has spent time on Denali was a great choice. Special thanks to Alpine Ascents International, the guiding service we utilize for their excellent leadership and preparation. If you like the video and want to see more in the future, don't forget to subscribe.